Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, I am Liam Eagle. I am an analyst uh, at 451 Research. I cover the web and application hosting space, which, uh, as you will see in a moment, is very germane to the conversation that we're about to have. Uh, I guess the, 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 the subject of our panel here is value-added services and how hosting providers can add value to their business by, you know, creatively packaging value-added services. Um, I guess, you know, this is, this is a notion that sort of underpins what we're doing here at World Hosting Days, what we're doing in the hosting business, uh, finding services to attach to hosting itself in order to make it more valuable and more sticky and more appealing to customers. So uh, I've got, uh, as you can see, a quite a large panel here of uh, excellent uh, technology providers, and I'm going to have them all introduce themselves really quickly, just sort of tell you about what they do and what keeps them up at night. I'm going to start uh, at the far end with Chet and just sort of work our way back, and then when, when you're done, I'll know that everyone's introduced. <laughs> Check it, Liam. So my name's Chet Kwiatkowski. I'm with uh, Web's Planet. Uh, we're a pure white label web presence provider. Uh, we operate globally, and we work with T1 and T2 companies, specifically hosters, really enabling them to be able to offer uh, websites, mobile sites, social sites, and a whole host of other relevant value-added services to both their retail and their OEM channels. Okay. Uh, my name is Diana Spalero. I work with Core PSA. Uh, I do the business development part. Uh, we are a software company. We do IP, PBX, unified communication solutions, and uh, we're currently working on launching Collaboration Suite, which comes on top of the uh, of VoIP now, the uh, IP, PBX solution. I'm Wilfred Beek. I'm the founder and CEO of ePages, and we're providing a white label solution for eShops uh, to the hosting industry and telecommunication companies. And uh, our solution is entirely, of course, cloud based and uh, is targeting the SMB market. Hi, my name is Jonas Falk. I'm co founder uh, and um, CEO of. Uh, uh, Halon Security uh, in the US entity. We do also have a Swedish entity. Um, we uh, call ourselves the e email platform and infrastructure uh, solution for hosting providers. Uh, we developed this real cool, amazing platform uh, targeting hosting providers and, and seeing um, you know, things like scalability, uh, clustering, uh, doing, you know, deliverability and security infrastructure for hosting provider within email space. Um, hi guys, my name is Sam. Um, I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Spam Experts. I guess most of you know Spam Experts already. Um, well, we've been 10 years around. We do email security. 95% um, of our clients are hosting companies. Uh, we do inbound filtering, spam and virus filtering, outbound filtering to protect our IPs from getting blacklisted, and email archiving. Um, yeah, and we really tailor our products to the hosting community. Um, I guess that's it. Not much more to tell. Yeah, hello, I'm Daniel Wetter. I'm CEO and founder of Ranking Coach. With Ranking Coach, we provide an a online marketing solution tailored to the needs of small business to increase their online visibility in the web and gain more business. Um, we founded Ranky Coach two years ago, and I do now for around about 18 years online marketing um, in different positions. All right, thanks very much, guys. And we did that very quickly, that was great. Um, so I guess let's start at a pretty high level. Let's sort of ask, you know, there are some g general, um, you know, opportunities in, in attaching value add services to hosting like ARPU and stickiness, but you know, how should hosts think about the benefits of value-added services for infrastructure-focused hosting providers in a general sense? And I was going to throw this one to Diana first. Okay, uh, being the lady here. <laughs> ladies first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I counted seven ladies in the room, which doesn't make me feel that unique anymore. Um, normally, so when we think about uh, hosters, in our opinion, we, we look at them from the perspective of managed uh, service providers, so we don't see them as hosters uh, only. So uh, obviously for us, it's a given that they will offer something more than simple hosting. Uh, obviously, stickiness means to offer something that doesn't look like um, creating a haystack. So I've seen a lot of marketplace schizophrenia, uh, which means that they put applications there 
that had nothing to say to each other. This doesn't really create value. <laughs> it only creates confusion. So what we've noticed to create value was to have applications which communicated uh, with each other through APIs, which created real value and stickiness, and the user would come back to you for more and more applications. Obviously, it needs a bit more resource than simply putting them together. It needs integration. Uh, then another thing, obviously, the AR view that you mentioned. Um, by having uh, solutions that actually uh, become modular so that you can actually sell as Lego pieces, you can create uh, AR view value. Because uh, we've seen this time and time again when we were creating hubgets and the licensing thing. Um, when we said that we're going to iterate like every two months and give them a new module every two months, their eyes were like getting brighter and brighter. So it's obviously that um, it's going to create value if you give people what they can sell very fast and like very visibly. Yeah, and I, I can actually add to that too. I, I believe in that too. We have done similar stuff like having an ecosystem of open source projects around the main platform that we have. Um, I think that's very good, especially for the hosting environment and, and, that, and that type of companies. Uh, they want to do a lot of integration. They want to see a lot of, you know, different modules and how to package it. Um, so I fully agree. Yeah. Okay. Anyone? Anyone? Everyone's cool. Okay. So I guess, so there's an interesting kind of thing that I think happens because I and a lot of the folks here have been for many years involved in the hosting space. We sort of tend to start thinking about the hosting infrastructure as sort of the center of the universe and that, you know, every other service is sort of attached around that core. Um, you know, there are other ways into small businesses. I was going to sort of ask this question in the chat. So should hosting providers be looking at this idea as sort of packaging services around the core hosting infrastructure or is something else at the core or what does that depend on? So I think it's a good question. Um, I think we're all guilty on some level of thinking that, you know, our product or service is the center of the universe. Um, and something tells me that when a small business owner wakes up in the morning, um, the first thing he's not thinking about is hosting. So um, I think that what he's probably saying to himself is a few things. One is, how do I earn more money today than I did yesterday? Um, two, um, how can I be able to more efficiently manage my business? And three, how do I get people other than friends and family coming through my door? So ultimately generating leads. Um, and I think that ultimately, um, if you can be able to uh, bundle services that speak directly to those needs, um, you'll find that you'll have much greater success in being able to um, uh, package that and deliver it so it's easily digestible for the small business owner. Okay. Um, and this is sort of a follow-on to that question, but so considering the, the, the ways that you can go to market, uh, do, do small businesses consider the hosting provider or tend to consider the hosting provider to be the source for these things? Do they look to somebody else? Uh, does that change as you move to different types of businesses? Do enterprise think differently about how to acquire these different services? I wanted to throw this one to Sam. Well, I think you touched upon, I think, the key problem that we're facing in, in our industry. Um, I have I agreed to everything that's so, so far said, but I think the key problem that we're facing is and therefore, I also think the, the title of our presentation is a little confusing, and you can probably see it behind us. Um, how, to, how the cloud will boost sales. I, I don't think it's, it's the cloud that will boost sales, it's you that has to boost the sales. Um, so one of the problems that we're facing here is I think that um, web hosting companies have grown out of a luxury position that SMEs, um, they need a domain name, they need hosting, um, they will find that hopefully come to you, buy it from you. Uh, but next, how much interaction do you have with your clients? And how well do you know your clients' needs for additional services that you want to sell them in order to increase that ARPU? Um, if you can answer those questions, great. I think a um, uh, lion's share of the hosting companies out there can't answer those questions. Um, but if you can, great. Next, I think you have to ask yourself is, um, do I have that regular connection and interaction with the client base? Am I the consultant they go to, they turn to, if they're looking for an additional service? And I also think there that the hosting community is facing a lot of problems because 
Um, I think most SMEs today, when they wake up, as you just said, they don't think directly about the web hosting company and that they have their, their site hosted. They're thinking about other things. Um, and um, if they are already at the level to think, okay, I need this and that service, they probably Google it and find it, try three ser service providers and buy it somewhere. Um, but I think the real opportunity in the cloud and all these cloud services that you can add to your portfolio is building that trust relationship with your clients, being able to consult them on what their needs are, what services are out there to serve them and help their needs, and then sell that to them via your cloud offering, make it easy and accessible. And then you have this recurring um, relationship. Um, if you don't have that, and that's, I, I really truly believe the basics, you won't be successful. And I think why have we been talking about this already for 10 years now? Um, maybe because we're missing the basics. Um, and whether that's different uh, from your question, whether that's different for small, medium businesses or enterprises, three, I don't really think so. I think it's for everyone the same, um, the same principle. Uh, and I think if you, if you think about industries that are very successful at that, um, if, if you look at the Microsoft ecosystem, you know, the hosts that operate in that ecosystem, they're hosting Microsoft products, they're selling that. Probably a, a large, large section of you are doing that already. Um, but these guys, they, they truly understand the client, they really have that consultancy relationship, and they're very successful at selling services. Um, that said, you also need salespeople, right? <laughs> So, no, I don't think it's logical that people uh, look at the host for these services. I think you have to cultivate this relationship with your client base. And once you cultivate <coughs> it, you understood it, that's the moment you can um, benefit and, and take, take this opportunity on. Um, maybe I'm surpassing the question. <laughs> no, I, I think remember. it actually leads very well into the next question. And okay. One of the things that I, I have been considering, and I'm going to try to keep my own talking to a minimum here, but... I have been considering a lot lately is that there's this interesting stratification in the hosting space where, you know, everything used to sort of fall into this one big bucket, whereas now, you know, the kind of customer who goes to something like Wix is obviously very, very different from the kind of customer who goes to something like DigitalOcean, and you have these, you know, these two totally different use cases. Now, in between that, we have what we, you know, traditionally refer to as the hosting providers, and, you know, the opportunity for those guys is to kind of bundle all these services together and create these packages of services or to, to deliver them in some other way. What I think is interesting is that one of the challenges with, with going to market with, with third-party value-added services is to say, if all the hosting providers have this opportunity to package the service and sell it on to their customers, what exactly is the value that that hosting provider is bringing to the table? I wanted to put this one to, to Wilfred. Well, I think, again, I want to start with the customer. And uh, you know, the SMB customer, ideally, when, when he looks at this digital uh, world of digital solutions, you know, he wants to have one single point of contact. And we, we've seen that in the history that, uh, you know, why are all large enterprise or many large enterprises turning to SAP and Oracle uh, to run all of their um, requirements? Or, you know, what happened when Microsoft released Office and basically destroyed three world leaders, Novell, Lotus, and WordPerfect. Um, why did customers turn to Microsoft Office instead of sticking with what they had? Because they wanted one integrated solution, even if they operate them separately and they don't really integrate very much, yeah, but they want one point of contact. And that's the same here. And uh, we all know customers are looking not only for domains and, and websites or web shops, but you know, CRM solutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're looking for uh, a, you know, a complete uh, a solution that's run by one point of contact that they can hold responsible for. And I think the hosting industry has a very good opportunity to be exactly that, uh, to have something like you know, Microsoft had with Office. And, uh, and we will see in the next few years whether the uh, pure play model with you know, a Wix in, uh, or uh, Squarespace in the website builder market or in our space of e-shops, there's a Shopify big commerce uh, as pure players, whether this uh, is more attractive to uh, SMBs or the, the solution that's you know, all in one box. And I, you know, from history, I think it's the solution that's provided by a single source. And this is a strong proposition or a strong position that the hosting industry is in or could be in. 
I think there's an interesting opportunity. Again, I'm going to try not to talk too much. <clears throat> I think there's an interesting opportunity for, uh, and yeah, I uh, uh, will, uh, well, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, yeah, because I think also, I agree both with you two guys, uh, definitely, but also what we see some, some of the trends is the quality of, of the services as well, which is very important as well. So, um, I mean, that's also, I mean, if, even if we're lowering the prices and whatever we're doing, we have to also, you know, think about the quality especially from you know, mission critical systems that has to be up all the time. That's also important to add to the discussion as well. Okay. I was gonna suggest that another opportunity is sort of the idea that you know, something that is as sort of casting as wide a net as Wix or something that is as sort of raw and sort of unpolished as AWS or just those sort of raw infrastructure products, in between those, there's this opportunity to sort of identify and really understand your customers, like Sam was saying, and, and identify the use cases where you say, because you are a, let's say, a restaurant, you need you know these seven things, and they work together this way, and you know that's kind of a level of customization that you can't necessarily get with, you know, with a generic solution. So, I guess the one of the sort of essential questions with regard to you know adding value added services is when when should hosting providers you know think about building their own products versus when should they partner with a third party versus when should they i don't know buy something or um, i wanted to start throwing that to Jonas all right well uh, that's a good question definitely and i might be a little bit biased here <laughs> uh, so i mean i i definitely believe that and i understand when uh, you know our customers or hosting providers and so on build their own systems you know probably starting up a business and, and you know you know why not build it yourself with a lot of great open source <coughs> that are out there eventually uh, when you grow your business you probably you might not have designed it in the way that you're going to grow your business as well uh, so we we see that quite often i would say um, homebrew you know Good platforms in the beginning, but when you expand your business and, and grow your business, then then that's usually when we come in and, and talk to them. Uh, and you know, it's like I live in San Francisco. I mean, I wouldn't build my own airplane for going here. You know, it's I, I, I used a vendor that's providing uh, you know the airplane and tickets and everything like that. So, it, in some certain situations, yeah. I mean, I I, I, I definitely. Uh, think that, that you can do it with the homebrew. However, I think there are specific vendors, specific solutions that are focusing on within whatever services, and eventually and long term, that's a more a, a better way to go. Okay. I, I wanted to ask the same question to Daniel, but before I do, I want to say, you know, I think there's this interesting thing in the hosting space where because there are so many, especially in the sort of smaller, medium-sized hosting providers. You know, there are so many people who are excellent technologists and are, you know, in this business because they're very good at, you know, building technology and, and, and operating this technology that they have a sort of an attachment to doing it themselves or an attachment to, you know, working with, you know, an open source tool that might be really complex, whether yeah. it's, you know, DNS or, you know, something to do with mail. I mean, do you guys find that you, or have, have any of you guys had experiences where you have a really hard time sort of talking people out of doing it themselves? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. Um, and, and we keep on, I mean, this is quite often that happens to us. So, um, and, and I, I'm, I, I'm a true believer of open source. We use a lot of open source in our product as well. Uh, and we contribute back to the open, like BSD kernel and so on. But, uh, and that's one of the reasons that I mentioned earlier that, you know, having an ecosystem of open source uh, makes sense. Because I think this type of clients and customer and this market is very um, used to using open source, so it makes sense uh, from that perspective. But also from you know security perspective as well, um, doing a lot of open source and not being closed. I, I I think it's real horrible to be closed. It's hard to say, but uh, by by being very open and, and showing what you're doing, uh, there's an audit uh, layer of of uh, communication as well. Okay. Um, maybe to add to that, I think your question really is when to build yourself and when to outsource, right? I mean, yeah. um, in the end, it's, it's a cost-benefit uh, choice, um, I guess, for everyone to make. And uh, I think we see the same thing as what you see, is that at some point, uh, web hosting companies in the email space at least realize that they've been you know, managing their uh, email security platforms uh, for a while. It takes them too much time, it eats up resources, et cetera. They invest in a professional solution. Yeah. Others 
um, they have optimized it, it works well, and I advise them to stick with that, you know? Um, if there is no problem, there is no need to change. Um, if your cost-benefit ratio, you know, depends on which, one, which, which direction it tilts to. Yeah. But um, so, so it, I think there is a third option, besides doing it yourself, of buying directly from an external. Um, in, in the Netherlands, competition, I'm, I'm from Amsterdam, and in the Netherlands, uh, competition is not necessarily a bad thing. Competition often faces the same problems. So a lot of you guys in the room are facing the same problems. If you don't have the resources in-house to build what you need, but you also don't want to invest in this external platform, maybe a few of your colleagues are facing the same problems and you can do something together. Um, and, uh, a famous example of this in the Netherlands is that everyone was facing DDoS attacks. And, and a, a group of the larger web hosting companies in the Netherlands um, grouped together and, and built this platform uh, to protect our infrastructure from DDoS attacks. Um, they did this together, they shared the resources, they sh shared the investment, and they shared the benefits. And I think that's, that's a good alternative that people often overlook uh, in this option. That's interesting. So Daniel, do you have a... I don't know if we're getting off topic, though. <laughs> well, I wanted to throw the builder by thing to Daniel as well. Do you, do you have uh, thoughts on that? Mm, yeah, I think it's also a question of speed. Um, if you um, integrate an external uh, vendor, it's uh, normally much, fa uh, much faster than developing your own tool. Um, I saw many de developers uh, think, for example, building a shop system can't be so difficult, um, uh, but um, later they see um, how difficult it is to uh, build a scalable system. And um, as when you find a solution that fits to 90% of your needs, it's, I think, always the cheapest way to, to partner um, and use an external solution. I saw uh, with, with the discussion with bigger hosters, um, they, they choose a middle way uh, in building their, their own front end on, uh, on a third party solution um, and use uh, for all technical parts a third party solution. So that's, for, ex for example, um, GoDaddy uh, was integrating local web with GetFrowns. Um, actually, a good point that you're making, I think. And to be honest, this is not coming from me. This is coming from another speaker at another conference. And I tried to remember who it was at which conference, but I can't. Um, too many conferences in the last weeks. Good. But um, I think the point was that, um, gee, what was the point? <laughs> <laughs> Speed? No, yeah, no, about selecting the partners, right? You, you're basically making a choice, am I doing this yourself or am I outsourcing? If you're making a choice on outsourcing, um, the, the considerations that you make when selecting a partner are so important. You really need to ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve with the product, you know? Imagine you're trying to increase your ARPU, which is kind of the topic of today. Um, then uh, the point that, that was made, and I really wish I could give the reference here, um, was that you need to select a partner with a clear partner model that has somebody ask your, the company that you plan on doing business with, um, ask them, do you have, I think it was the Odin Summit last week. Um, so far I am, I don't know yet who, who said this, but um, ask the company that you're doing bu business with, who's the channel manager, who is in charge of managing the contact with partners like me, you know? If they don't have any, they don't understand you. Don't do business with them, right? Um, they're not made for you. They're probably made for something else, and maybe that solution helps you. But if you're serious about selling this into your channel, your client base, you want to partner up with a company that's understanding your channel and that's also serious about helping you succeed. Um, so, and there was a few more considerations. I recommend checking the Odin uh, presentation. Some good remarks made there. Maybe I, I'd like to you know, add one point that I've often seen that when uh, a hosting company, uh, even the large ones, when they want to bring a solution to the market, they look at the current market and the current requirements that their teams have put together. And even in, in, in most cases, we can only uh, meet 90% of those requirements. And, but they're looking for the extra 10, so they decide to, to build it themselves. And then what happens is usually it takes them a year or two or longer and then the market has completely changed. Uh, and, uh, and there are these disruptive, dis disruptive moments 
uh, one we've seen in the last five years of mobile uh, devices coming to the market. And now, all of a sudden, you need a completely different website builder. It needs to be you know, responsive and, and things like that. So the market is completely changing, and, and uh, the hosting providers are not fast enough to react to that. So now they've built something for what they thought was perfect for their market, but it was perfect for five years ago. And we are much faster in adopting to these new requirements, because that's all we do. Right. Uh, adopting to the to the to, to new situations, and that's why it's I think in the long run much better to to partner. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to sh shift gears a little bit, but this is a question for you, Wilfred, too. Is so there? Are, you know, there are a whole bunch of different go-to-market strategies for bundling or or, or attaching value-added services around hosting, and you know. Um, once upon a time, people were really excited about putting things into app stores, and then, you know, more recently, I've heard, you know, hosting customers don't buy things from app stores, and, uh, you know, some products really do well if you put them in the registration flow, or some products like probably like yours, Wolf, would really need to be sort of front and center as a, as a, as an offering, um, or you know, I, I mean, is there some sort of upsell that you do over time? I mean, what are what are the sort of relative, or, or or do you you know create bundles around certain use cases like? What are the go-to-market strategies that work best with, with hosting? I guess. Well, I, I guess you know most of the traffic that comes to hosting providers is for domains and, and hosting space. You know? But but in this initial moment when the customer he's comparing different vend vendors maybe, but uh, and then he decides on on one vendor maybe for price or for whatever reason or, or services. Uh, and I think one of the reasons could be, you know, the breadth of the, the offering. But, but during the initial process, it's imp in, in any case, it's very important to show the breadth of your offering. What, what else could you be buying from, from this vendor? Because that person or that company might never come back because he might have just come for the domain. And if you don't show during the registration process what else you could be offering, then uh, he doesn't get the picture uh, of what he could be buying from you. And uh, so I think that is mission critical for all the partners that we have, that during the, the initial purchase process, he shows or he gives you options of you know, cross-selling and, and so on. Um, and even if that company doesn't decide to purchase a web builder or a, a e-shop or whatever else, or uh, uh, an SEO solution at that very moment, then he, he, he knows that. But of course, you know, I know from my experience, it's much more likely that he even buys it at that time. So I, th I think doing it in the initial phase is, is really important. Um, bundling it, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of app stores. <laughs> so, but but you know, we're in, in six weeks from now, we're going to launch an own app store for e-pages. But that's a different scenario because then we have a customer who's already using an e-shop, and we're offering him to put add-ons on top of that e-shop in a very specific scenario. Whereas, I'm a fan of app stores. <laughs> well, in in a specific sure. uh, 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 scenario, but not. I mean, there, I I. I cannot see any app store that has ever succeeded, maybe with the exception of, of, of Apple, in, in a much broader market. Uh, all the telcos and all the hosting providers that I know have failed with their app stores for SSMEs. Yeah, yeah that, that was my experience as well. I, I haven't seen app stores to be as successful as Apple's, obviously. Yeah. And uh, from vendors, from software vendors' point of view, um, it doesn't really ma make much sense to be in an app store that is not visited. And yeah. here, we, <laughs> yeah, uh, hosters don't buy from app stores. This is the experience that we've seen. Um, but to hook into that, um, and I, I don't know what your take on that is. Um, if if the app stores don't, I mean, is the concept of app stores not working, or no, is, no, no, is no. The, the concept is fine? It's just that I I, I believe that the um, the targeting is not correct or is not well meant yeah. in this situation. Um, the implementation, you know, the idea is great. The implementation doesn't <laughs> look good. Yeah. And uh, about the suggestion of, of implementing it in the, um, in the ordering process, I think that's, that's important. It creates visibility, awareness, et cetera. It gives an option to buy directly. But I think the statistics show that it's not very successful. Um, and I don't have latest statistics, and I only have a small sample, but it's less than 5% from your new orders that actually buy these additional services. And then um, how much does it cost you to implement this additional service? 
versus your client base and new clients that you get in to make this a worthwhile investment for you, right? So yes, sure, GoDaddy, for them it works. Um, uh, Endurance Group has a bunch of brands uh, that are big enough for the numbers game to work. But I'd like to revert back to my initial point, guys, if you're not one of those, um, and you are interested in selling cloud services, build this personal relationship, right? Understand your client base, uh, know what they're looking for, <laughs> advise them, consult them, and sell it through this form. Um, and I think it's gonna be much more successful, and I think it's visible how successful it is by this major channel of MSVs still coexisting next to you. When, I, when you asked me 10 years ago, I would have expected you guys to kill that market already a long time ago, but I was wrong. And I think the key reason why I was wrong is that they do have that customer relationship and that consultancy relationship and the trust relationship with the client, that personal uh, relationship, which you don't in many <coughs> cases. Um, so I think this is where your major opportunity is if you want to be successful here. Um, um, same, same what question. do I know? So I w yes, I would just add, I completely agree with you as it relates to the registration flow. I think there's pros and cons to uh, bundling, but I think, you know, offering too much too fast right out of the gate could actually be counterproductive because, um, you know, uh, it could potentially lead to a, a higher abandonment rate when you might have actually had the, uh, uh, the SMB hooked uh, for one or two services as opposed to introducing several right, right out of the gate. Um, we've seen with our partners that bundling has worked really well, um, you know, and they're able to consolidate several services that the business owner ultimately needs. And in terms of, you know, margin and how they're able to, to, to price that, um, you know, there's obviously going to be some, uh, some more wiggle room when you're, uh, when you're bundling these services um, in a package as opposed to selling it as a standalone. So I think that that's an advantage as well. Can I make, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Dan, <Go ahead>. <laughs> mm, I have a question. Because of uh, your low rates in selling in the shopping ba basket, you, s tell, you say something about 5%. No, I'm just looking on average services, right? So average add-on services, I think, uh, if you look at the major web hosting companies, very, very small percentage of the new signups buys these, you know, they buy web hosting, and then they go through a number of options to tick an add-on. And I think the average percentage is less than 5% for people. Depends on what you sell. I think, yeah, it's uh, relevant. Daniel, you have a very different number, <laughs> and I too. Uh, it's much higher. But I'm not talking about our services, right? <laughs> because most of our clients, they roll it out across the board. So um, it's, it's. We, our partners have much higher rates yeah? and, uh, at this point. It, I think it's uh, important that you sell products that are relevant uh, for your customer. And uh, a customer who buy an online shop for, for this customer, it's relevant to have an SL, SSL certificate. Someone who buys email, it's relevant uh, to buy your product. And someone who starts with his homepage or buys a website builder or um, a web space, uh, maybe it's relevant uh, um, to buy or sell um, an online marketing product. So relevance is, uh, and when you have products in your shopping basket with so low rates, uh, test it with, uh, change the product, uh, place other products there and test it. But 5% is bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. And um, then maybe if I can make a yeah, final remark, like the, uh, uh, another example I heard at another event, and I think it was Telecom Italia that gave a presentation about how they built their cloud marketplace um, and are successful actually at selling. Uh, they did uh, over 100,000 uh, transactions in the recent months, I think Q1, uh, in their cloud marketplace. And 100,000 for Telecom Italia might not be super successful, but it's still uh, a volume they're doing. Um, they said what they do is they focus on their core business, right, which is the telco business. And um, in the sign-up, they inform the client, their salespeople are informed, their support team is informed and helps in the sales process as well. Um, and they give away vouchers. So they have this voucher system where basically you sign up with the, with the core service and you get a voucher to shop around in their cloud to add these additional services which you are being consulted on by the salespeople of what is, what is relevant for you. And I think this is perfect, this makes sense, you know? Um, and uh, I think so there's, there's few examples of people that are successful, but it really requires a, a, an investment from you and it's not gonna go automatically, I think. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so, so 
this is kind of a question that I think everyone probably will have some input on too. I wanted to throw it to Diana first is, um, you know, are there any value added services out there that are a no brainer or that are, you know, a sort of killer value add for hosting providers that are still low hanging fruit? Or, or uh, maybe conversely, if anyone wants to answer this part too, I mean, is there any out, anybody out there who was doing a perfect job of bundling value adds? I'm tempted to say no for the perfect job, um, but um, definitely there are low hanging fruit. Um, once again, I'll go back to the API story. Um, it's a no brainer that creating applications and going uh, in a context, just like Sam said before about Telecom Italia and targeting a specific context will get you the results. With Telecom Italia, I believe that in the Italian market, they have this context of uh, reaching out for the, um, for the actual end user. And they also, the end user reacts to vouchers. In certain markets, this won't happen, I'm quite sure. But that specific context is uh, a success scenario. For um, applications, uh, if, from my perspective, so if I were a hosting provider and if I had the resources, mine, they're, they need to have these resources, and I'm quite sure that they believe they don't, but in most cases they do, they can create uh, applications that answer the needs of their customers, the ones that they should be connected with. So this is very important, that connect connectivity that Sam was talking about, that is the key and the base point of the successful part of the business. If you know what they want, you can give it to them easily. Okay. All right, so I guess, what are some of the real difficulties that hosts encounter or that they will, or they're you know, almost certain to face when integrating these kind of services with their existing products or with their existing platforms? I'll answer those to be honest. Well, <clears throat> that's, it's a very good question. Um, I think you should take into consideration of, uh, for instance, our case, um, what kind of uh, integration you're gonna do, how the API is built, uh, also from security perspective as well, um, from the integration of the platform, the design, and um, I, th I think some of the things that we usually end up talking to our customers are, you know, thinking big from the beginning <laughs> and, and scaling uh, from the beginning. Because, I mean, we all want to grow our business, right? And uh, if you do the homework from the beginning, uh, when you're gonna integrate the product into your platform and, and think big from the beginning, then it's all gonna make sense when you are growing your business, of course. Uh, but also, you know, layer of uh, security as well. I think that's very important. Uh, designing the whole implementation with that in your mindset. Um, and look also, you know, for instance, we all know that, you know, um, the web, is, is a layer that is getting a lot of attacks. Separate that, you know, depending on your core, your back end, and so on, uh, and, and talk to your vendors about it. How do you think? What do you want to do? And stuff like that. And also to the discussion we had earlier, uh, you know, what is your roadmap? I mean, we as a vendor, I mean, I, I, I use this all the time, and it's getting very appreciated. I mean, I want to hear out you guys what are your roadmap? What are the expectations? And see new opportunities to bring on the on the table as well. I mean, we touched base on it a little bit and, and uh, different ways. I mean, it's all probably a little bit different depending on which business we are in and market and so on. But again, I think it, 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 that's one of the, the, the things that is very important. Security in mind. Have security in mind. Um, build the platform, integrate it. Uh, with a, a potential of growing your business and think big. Yeah, that's good advice. So I have another question I want to put to Daniel, and then I have an, a lot, sort of a final question I want to throw across the whole board. But so I guess, you know, as we all know, there are, there are sort of tools and platforms out there and other services hosts can look to to help them simplify the process of integrating these kind of services and to provision and, and operate and, and uh, orchestrate them. Uh, how should host providers sort of think about that? environment. Yeah, I think when, when they use such platforms at o, uh, like Odin or cPanel or any other platform, they should use uh, these features and um, de um, publish, uh, integrate partners um, with these packages because um, on the long term, 
uh, they are faster, it's easier to maintenance um, um, these plugins um, than to maintain 10s or 20, uh, 20, 30 individual APIs where the developer has um, um, to handle different styles of code. And so it's easier in the long term. Um, in, but our biggest partners uh, use a direct I API uh, currently. Um, so it depends on the host. Depends on the case, yeah. <laughs> so this is sort of something that Wilfred touched on earlier, but it, you know, the ability to, to sort of recognize what's coming down the path or to respond quickly to things that are coming out. Um, I just want to sort of get a sense from everybody, you know, how do you guys see this process of, you know, uh, the sort of channel role of hosting providers and the, the, the uh, packaging of the services of third-party technology providers to deliver to their own customers. I mean, how do you see that process, that environment, that ecosystem changing over the next, you know, three, five years? Um, and just anybody who wants to answer can just go. <laughs> I, think, I think that the DIY uh, players are going to find uh, some additional challenges as we go forward. I think more and more we're going to start to see hosters getting into the managed services space if they haven't already done so, just because there's just such an abundance of opportunity there. Um, so I think um, you know, we're at sort of a, a critical point where you're gonna see a lot of the, the strictly DIY players start to, start to slowly move in that direction, not losing the sort of core of, of who they are as a company, but just sort of evolving as, as we go forward. Something interesting that I always listen to all the, you know, there's not a ton of public hosting companies, but I always listen to all their earnings calls. And web.com, you know, they're really focused on, you know, uh, doing the design and doing the, the sort of uh, consultative managed service on a big scale for, for smaller customers. And they have, you know, these, they, they do a lot of do it for me style site building and stuff like that. And on their most recent earnings call, they, they were talking about how they have this you know, more, they call it do it with me. So they have, they have a, uh, you know, a, a do it yourself site builder type tool where you can have somebody, you know, working with you to build out the site while you do it. I think it's like, Interesting to see how many different models we can squeeze in between there. Anyone else thoughts for the future? We could throw out some questions from the crowd. I really hope that uh, that it's true that we're moving more towards the, towards that service provider, uh, yeah. true consultancy role uh, in the service provider market. Um, but if you would have asked me five years ago, I would have answered the same way. <laughs> and uh, and thought I, we would have been there by now. Exactly. <laughs> but I truly hope that that will change. Yeah. Uh, does anyone in the crowd, we've got a few minutes left, does anyone in the crowd have a, a question for our, our, uh, our illustrious panel? All right, well, I've got a question that I wrote down while we were talking. Um, I think that some of you guys are sort of philosophically attached to certain uh, positions on, uh, you know, whether your product should be able to be white labeled or not by your partners or whether that's something that your partner would want. And I, I realize in certain cases that's sort of dependent on the product. You don't necessarily want to have a white label SSL certificate, for instance, but you know, certain products like ePages is completely white label, right? Do you guys have sort of a stance on what is best suited for hosting providers? Or I guess maybe I'll start with Wilfred because I know that you're I think it was mentioned before that um, you know, as a company, you have to be prepared uh, to work with a hosting provider. So that's why we decided clearly to be a white label solution. And we have 20 people in marketing, but all they do is create marketing material for hosting providers. Uh, th th there's maybe one person who works on our own website right. and our own marketing. Uh, and, and there's you know, uh, half a job for creating events like this for us. But um, the rest is all going into products that we're uh, putting into the channel of hosting providers. And I think that's important that you have, it's a different model and uh, hosting providers should be looking out for companies that are set up to, to work with them. I think everything else will fail. If somebody, if somebody has its own brand in the market and tries to sell direct and trying to partner at the same time, it, I've never seen that really working very well. Uh, so, um, but on the other side, we, of course we want to create a brand of e-pages. You know, once we have customers using the product, I think it, it's a good moment to tell them well, this is ePages. They've been in, in e-commerce for 20 years. They really know what they're doing. Right. So they should not hide the fact that they are using third parties. Right. Uh, sure. and, uh, and, and, and very often, they still want to keep it all under their brand and not even mention that it's something, you know, somebody else who's created 
this service. Anyone else have a time that they'd like to pass? Well, we have 16 seconds left. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, but um, maybe, right, well. <laughs> maybe one, one thought there is, I think it also re really, again, depends on your geographical location, your client base, right. and the service, obviously. Um, but if you look at email security, for instance, if you look at email security in the Netherlands, um, or most of Western Europe and large parts in the US, uh, people include email security for free in their hosting package, uh, just a premium email product, right? Um, if you look at Brazil uh, or another uh, market, uh, email security is really an, an upsell. Yeah. And depending uh, on that and how you want to position it, um, it's sometimes beneficial to show that you bought an external product which you are paying for, and therefore you know, you're giving premium value. Or maybe you want to uh, show this as your own brand and uh, make you look as a full-fledged service provider, you know? So it's, I think, in the end, a really personal choice. Yeah, Thanks. up to the provider. All right, we are out of time. Uh, thank you guys all very much for sticking around. And thanks very much to our panel for uh, uh, participating. So thank you.